Hi, we're live. We're up and running officially. Um, welcome everyone. How are you today? Um, everybody knows what day it is, right? I, I'm too excited. I don't even know how to think. Uh, what day is it? <gasps> Teaching Tuesday. Woo! I figure these have become now like my trademark. So we're gonna be seeing a lot of jazz hands today. Um, so welcome, um, welcome back to those who have witnessed, uh, come and join our talks before. Um, welcome to first timers. Um, I'm really excited to announce that not only are we live on Facebook and YouTube today, um, we've added Twitter to it. I had to think about which one. So we're on Twitter. So now we're, we're, you know, live streaming on all three. So hello to all of you. However, you are calling into us um, today and watching. Um, and per usual on Teaching Tuesdays, I want to know who's here with us. Um, so use the comments. Um, tell us where you're from who you're watching with, are you a teacher, are you a student, are you just an educated, uh, an excited lifelong learner that just, you know, can't get enough Mount Vernon? Um, let us know. Lori is calling in from Illinois. That's exciting. Warren came back. Welcome back, Warren. We're happy to see you again. Um, ooh, we got Catherine from Massachusetts. I'm gonna do this for a while. I'm going to try and call out as many people as I can because we're getting people joining as, as we start. Ooh, John Austin is a museum professional. That's someone else. So yeah, let us know. Teachers, students, museum professionals, excited lifelong learners, anything. Tell us anything about you, who you are. Derek is watching all the way from Arizona. Oh, that's so cool. Um, Bethany's from Virginia, so we got local. Oh my gosh. Hi, Bethany. New Jersey. Okay, I'm glad Kansas Historical Society, Lauren Gray is tuning in. This is awesome. This I just I love that we're all so apart, but we're all together here on what day? Teaching Tuesday. Uh, and you're I'm probably more excited than normal because not only are we studying primary sources, so we're just gonna dive into like our favorite subject ever. Um, we're doing recipes today. So I think I just have like a contact sugar high uh, that I can't explain. Um, we got a history professor from Boston. Uh, ooh, Paul Pinkerton from Farmington, Missouri. Welcome. Um, Mandy and Emma. Hi guys. You're watching from Virginia. That's exciting. Um, oh my God. Okay. We got a lot of people. We're getting East coast. We're getting West coast. We're getting Midwest. Everyone's here. We're gonna have an awesome day. Um, and I hope you all are running a sugar high primary source high by the time we're finished as well. Um, because as we talked about last week, Primary sources are awesome. They are the bread and butter of the museum work that we do, the historical work. Um, and so just kind of looking out there to all of our friends that are calling in from Virginia, Justine's in San Diego, California, Francis is in South Jersey, Ryan the teacher is uh, with us. Um, so now, now that we kind of have an idea of where we're all calling from, let's talk about primary sources and do a little bit of a recap because we have to do a recap um, of why we love them so much. What are some of the reasons that we can't get enough of primary sources? Oh, yes, wait, before we start, stop, 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 stop. I mean, just keep talking about primary sources, we love them. Um, but I have an announcement to make. Um, because those tuning in with us on Facebook, um, we have a really great opportunity. 
Um, we have had a generous donation from the Hamill family of Arizona, um, and they are allowing us to give away a free family membership um, to one of our viewers. So if you're on Facebook, comment away, answer our questions, talk to us, because that's going to be an automatic entry um, to win this membership. Um, and we'll go ahead and announce the winner at the end of the day. This is a great opportunity because Mount Vernon, look at us. We're still strong. We're coming at you and we're going to come back and you're going to have to all come see us and see our primary sources in person and see the mansion that Dr. Bradburn and Adam Irby are showing you. Um, and this is a great opportunity to bring the whole family. So comment away, get registered for this drawing. Um, it's an incredible opportunity. Thank you, Hamill family. Yay, we love Arizona. Well, we love everybody, okay? Um, so thank you for the reminder of that. Whew. Sorry. I'm ready. Okay, so back to primary sources. Why do we love them? What are some of the reasons that you love using them for your homework, that you use them with your classes, um, that you use them on your own just to investigate topics that you're interested in. What makes primary sources so great? Um, so please answer away in the comments because there are gonna be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reasons. I'm gonna give you all time to answer. Learn to find the truth. Yep, Linda, oops, over here. Linda, that's a great, great reason. They help us learn to find the truth. Absolutely. Ooh, I like what Jamie said. Yeah, right here. I feel like I'm, you know. Uh, Jamie said, my kids get to form their own interpretations, right? It's leading them straight to the source. They get to read that account and then decide what happens. Absolutely. Um, what else did we see? Sarah Elizabeth, they allow students to get into the hearts and minds of people in our past. That's something really great to point out. Primary sources bring that personal connection um, to us, to our students. Um, they connect us to the people of the past. They, they help us really make those deep personal connections understand the complexities um, and really build those bonds, really you know, make connections from our life to their life. Um, that's absolutely a great reason. They're firsthand evidence. That's right. So primary sources, those are the raw materials of history. They are what connect us um, to the people because they were created at the time of study. Okay, Daniel. That is a good one. Primary sources give a very human connection to people living through the time or soon after, right? They were made in that time. They're the exact reference, the objects, the images that those people were studying. Um, and that was kind of my next question. Last week, you know, we talked about primary sources. We looked at an image, a painting as an original um, source. Okay, but we've also teachers, uh, some of you have mentioned documents, letters, diaries, journals, um, objects. Someone last week brought up that clothing is a great primary source. Um, textiles, um, Stacy Rounds said that primary sources make history come to life. That's right. So it's all these great connections. They help us really decide. But then there's another reason we love primary sources. Um, and that is that, you know, they help us build thinking skills. They help us kind of develop higher order thinking, um, critical thinking skills. They help us analyze, really allow us to become those history detectives and diving into items. So we get those connections to the past, but then we also get skills that we can, you know, utilize, heighten through our use of primary sources that can be transferable to other subjects. Um, to other subjects that we use. Um, so yeah, they're incredibly great. Um, and this week, 
the primary source that we are going to talk about um, is a recipe. Okay, so it's a recipe. Um, and some of you guessed last week, and we showed you our picture. It's a recipe of the great cake. Um, this is a recipe that was cooked quite often uh, at Mount Vernon uh, while the Washingtons lived there. And so we are going to take a look at this document. We're going to go through. We're going to pull out the same skills that we did last week. Because um, remember, when we looked at those painting that image, um, we kind of we analyzed it in three different layers. Um, the first one is just to observe, just to kind of engage that source, get to know it. The second set of questions, we reflect, we get a little deeper, um, we start inquiring about the source. And then the third is to use our historical evidence skills um, and start making big kind of broad assumptions about it. Um, and we talked about that that investigation of a primary source can be used for documents, images, um, objects. It's it's a great kind of three-step process that our archaeologists, our curators, our historians um, all use for their research. And so we're kind of going to use that same process today. So since we are really awesome um, at technology, I'm going to share my screen um, with you all uh, and show you Okay, here's the recipe. I am using it. It's from our digital collections at the Washington Library. So this is actually the original document that we own. Um, so looks good. Um, we're just gonna go from here, right? Yeah, everybody, thumbs up. Can you see it? We're good? Um, just kidding. Um, I know that it's hard to see. Um, but that is kind of a tricky thing about primary sources. They come in different shapes and sizes and qualities. Um, so this is the original document that we have, but for our work today, I'm back. Okay, for our work today, we are going to be looking um, at a transcript. So we did have um, staff of our editors and papers, historians, um, take a look and actually read through it. Um, and so that is what we are going to look at today. So I'm gonna do this. This is this is what we're gonna do. I'm, um, I'm gonna share my screen and okay. I'm gonna sh actually, oops, technical difficulties. Okay, I'm pulling it up. And any teachers out there have the same trouble working with new technology while you're uh, teaching? It's a new frontier that we're all dealing with. So I'm glad that we're doing it together. But OK, you know what? We're just going to share my entire screen. And then I'm going to bump over here. OK, so this is a great resource. And I'm going to talk about it at the end to say how you all can get it. But this is the transcript of the of the great cake recipe. So the transcript um, is just the written form. It's just the written out text of what is there. So this is exactly what is on that fuzzy piece of paper that we saw. And we went ahead and we numbered the sides just so you can see. And each line is exactly the spelling um, and the length of the original document. So this is everything. It's like we're looking at the original, okay? Um, so we're gonna start with our first level of questions. Okay? And I'm gonna ask them slower this week because I am gonna calm down a little because my sugar high is running up. We're gonna take it slow. Um, so feel free to answer these questions on your own um, or type them in the comment box. Um, and we'll put some of them up as we, as we work through this. Okay. So the first set of questions that we have. All right, so we're just going to observe the item. Okay. So what did you see first? What's the first thing you notice about this recipe?
as you look over the transcript and the source, um, pick out an ingredient, one ingredient. Where does it come from? Pick out a second ingredient. Where does that ingredient come from? All right, I'm gonna repeat those three just as you keep thinking. So what is the first thing you notice about this recipe? Okay, you picked an ingredient. Have you thought about where it came from? And then the second recipe, where did that come from? In looking at this recipe, are the measurements used in this recipe, are they the same or different as the measurements we use today? Okay. Are the instructions for this recipe clear? So take a look, think about these questions. What's the first thing you notice? Who wrote the recipe? We're looking at the ingredients. We're thinking about where they came from. We're looking at the measurements that we're seeing from these. Are these different ones? Are they the same as we use today? Um, and are the instructions clear? All right, I'm gonna come back. Oh, okay, hi. Um, and let's look at some of these. So we noticed half a pint of brandy and wine. Wowie. I mean, that's a big order. Adam picked out four pounds of butter. Okay. Ryan Hawkins, one of his ingredients that he saw were 40 eggs. Did you guys see that there are 40 eggs in this recipe uh, from chickens maybe at Mount Vernon? Okay. Um, Mandy Dean noticed different measurements. She thinks different measurements. Loves Brad, five pounds of flour. So that's, I mean, this is a big recipe, right? This is a really big type of, I mean, there are a lot of ingredients here. Jackie, is this for one cake? One cake, one. This is one cake, okay, that we're looking at, okay? What else do we have? Oh, somebody asked, did Martha Washington write this? That was a question, that was, that's a great observation that we can pull out um, and was a question I should have asked. And did anyone see, in looking at that transcript, did anyone see if Martha Washington wrote that recipe? I can put it back up because we are really good at sharing screens, remember? Okay, so in looking at this, just pulling out again, did Martha Washington write this recipe? That's a great observation, just kind of pulling through that basic information. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you guys, I think. Um, I think I'm coming back, hold on. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Um, great, the granddaughter recorded it, yeah. Um, her granddaughter, a lot of you are pulling out. Um, ooh, Michael Ben, this is a great point. Granddaughter wrote it based off Martha's recipe or granddaughter wrote it based off Martha's recipe. Yeah, so we're finding out that it is a recipe that Martha had um, that, that was in her kind of head and then her granddaughter recorded it. Um, so this is great. This is awesome. You guys have picked out the ingredients. Are you starting to kind of think that like, this is a big cake. This is taking a lot of ingredients. It's five pounds of flour. It's 40 eggs. There's no way this could be for one item. The grandchildren are writing it. Um, and so 
it's an interesting source. So now we've observed, right? We've engaged, we've understood our, our primary source on the surface level, and now we're gonna start diving a little deeper. Okay, so now we're gonna pull up our second round of questions. Okay, and again, I'm gonna share my screen because we are really good at this. And I'm gonna make it, okay. Everyone can see this, thumbs up. I'm picturing 15,000 thumbs up at me right now, okay? So, now we know it's a great cake, it's a big cake. It was written by Martha Washington's granddaughter, but it was Martha Washington's recipe, okay? So, now, our next layer of questions, all right? This is when we're gonna start inquiring about it. This is when we're going to start diving deeper. We're gonna try and make more sense of this recipe, okay? Um, the first question, is this recipe for a food that was eaten every day or just on special occasions? Okay. Um, special occasions or everyday food? Okay. Why might someone make this recipe? As we look at it, what kind of technology might be used to make this recipe? So we're thinking about it. Okay. Would you have eaten this recipe? That's a really good question. I like that one. Would you have eaten this recipe? Would you have made this recipe? I like those back to back. Would you eat it and would you make it? Because those are, as we know, two very different things, uh, okay? Um, does this remind you of anything that you eat today? Does this recipe remind you of any food that you eat today? Now, I wanna throw out another question. Okay. Since we've talked about, would you have eaten this recipe? Would you have made this recipe? So really let's look at it and think who would have eaten this recipe and who would have made this recipe at Mount Vernon in, their, in the Washington's time? So kind of the last question for this reflection is who would have been eating this recipe and who would have been making this recipe? That's a very important idea to think about uh, when we look at these documents. Even it think, it, you know, it's, all right, I'm coming back. Oop. Okay, I'm back. All right, so what did we think? What were some of the comments that we had uh, about this? So it looks like Stephanie Winchester said she'd eat it, but it would be too big to make for the family. That's, 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 that's probably true. I mean, 40 eggs, pounds of bacon or pounds of butter and flour. Um, that's a lot. Um, Adam Carmen thinks that this is for a special occasion, this cake. Okay. Great. Let's see, what else? Um, Emily thinks that it's a fruit cake. Ooh, I like that, Dr. Disco 57th, mainly just because I wanna say that username, Dr. Disco 57th, uh, thinks it might be special occasion um, and cakes for everyone. Um, and who is that everyone? Because um, remember one of our questions was, who is eating the cake and who is making the cake? Um, so, um, yeah, Emily is saying that the hostess for many guests, uh, cake made by the cook, often enslaved. And that's a, that's absolutely true for the case of Mount Vernon. Um, a lot of you were saying that Washington and Martha would have eaten the cake, that it's, it's for their friends. Um, it's a special occasion cake, um, right, right, right here. Yep, 
Washington and their guests would have been eating it. Um, but the cooking process would have fallen on other people. Um, the cooking process would have been mainly done by enslaved cooks in the kitchen. Um, so that's a great way to understand these recipes is, you know, just like when we looked at the documents, who's the intended audience and who's the maker uh, of this recipe. And so that's going to be a lot different. That's kind of that same idea that we're pulling when we were looking at the painting last week. Who painted it? Who's it for? And then, yeah, who's that intended audience that's going to see it? Uh, Brenda. Brenda for the uh, the assist here. Make Made by persons like Dahl, Lucy, Nathan, Hercules. Those are actual individuals. So some of the enslaved people um, who were working in the kitchen. So Brenda, thank you for saying that, giving us names, connecting this primary source to those people. Um, so that's awesome. Um, and I'm trying to think. Um, Ooh, history and aviation wants to try it. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like a pretty good uh, thing. Do you guys sell this cake at Mount Vernon? Um, that's a little spoiler. Can I circle back to this uh, later at the end? Um, because uh, it's, uh, it's something that we can show you and it's a great resource that I wanna highlight too. Um, so you're thinking, you're jumping ahead and I'm loving that. Um, okay, so we've done two of our questions, right? We've observed the source, we've reflected on it, and now it's time for our third and deepest level set of questions um, that we're gonna be thinking about. So I'm gonna put the source back on, um, and these are gonna be our critical thinking questions. These are gonna be those ones where we are gonna take the information about Mount Vernon, the information about the 18th century that we already know because we've studied things before, whether in class with our students, in class with our teachers, or personally because we just love history, we're museum professionals, but we're gonna put those ideas together with this source, right? We're gonna find that puzzle piece where these sources fit in and connect it to that larger 18th century um, piece of information. Okay, um, so I'm gonna put it up. Because we're so good at technology and sharing our screens. Okay, Boop. here it is. Okay, so we are back with our source. Um, and it is time for those third level questions. And they are gonna be quite similar. If those of you that remember and were here with us last week, um, what we used. So first question, what can we learn about George and Martha Washington and their family from this recipe? You guys mentioned it was for special occasions. You mentioned that their family's eating it. So what can this recipe tell us about the lives of George and Martha Washington and their family? Um, question two, what can we learn about the enslaved population at Mount Vernon from this recipe? As Brenda pointed out, cooks like Hercules are possibly going to be making this cake. So what can that tell us about the enslaved population? What can we learn about life in the 18th century from this recipe? And finally, because we're those historians and we're those history junkies that want more and more and we're using our thinking skills, uh, what questions do we still have about this recipe? What do we wanna know more about? What ideas has this sparked that we wanna keep moving forward and think about? Okay, I'm coming back to you all. I'm coming back. Okay. Hi, I'm back. All right. So let's pull out some of these answers. 
um, that people have given. And also, I am loving these comments, by the way. I am loving how interactive uh, these sessions are. I hope you're enjoying them. Um, I'm loving getting your feedback. You guys are putting things through. I'm hoping it's because we love primary sources, but it's also because of the family membership. And that's an exciting offer that I'm going to remind people about. Comment on Facebook and you'll get into that drawing okay, for a free family membership. Okay. But anyways, I digress. Back to those questions. Um, what are we learning about George and Martha Washington from this recipe? Okay. Ooh, I, um, Mandy said they get a lot of guests. Uh, the enslaved population are skilled, uh, but may have memorized the recipe. So let's break down like that in two parts. So they get a lot of guests. That's something, yes that we can know about this cake is that as some of you said, this is too big for your family. You, it sounds delicious and you wanna eat it, but it's too big to cook. Um, so obviously this means that the Washingtons are cooking it, having it made for a lot of different people, right? So they're hosting a lot of people, they're having events at their house, this is big. Craig Carson said the same thing. They had hordes of guests all throughout the year. Um, yeah, I mean, their their home was kind of a revolving door of visitors staying, invited, uninvited, you know, coming. And so this cake would have been, you know, able to serve a lot of people. Um, let's see. Donation dessert said they hosted a lot of a large hosted large gathering gatherings. Um, let's see, Logan, what do you have? It took a lot of resources to make the cake and was costly to make spices, wine, brandy. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, not only is this cake big, um, it's pretty expensive to make. Do you think that every family in America is able to afford all of these ingredients? Um, you have spices, you have wine coming in, you have brandy, um, sugar. Did you guys see how much sugar was in this recipe? You know, this sugar is part of the international trade. It's coming from the Caribbean, from the slave plantations. Um, this recipe, this is a great connection to life in the 18th century. It really connects Mount Vernon to a global view. You know, we can bring that in. Mount Vernon was a self-sustaining plantation for a lot of you know a lot of aspects. It was eight thousand acres. Um, the enslaved population were catching fish. Um, they were growing wheat, um, providing income. They were taking care of the kitchen gardens, uh, feeding the families. Um, you know, but then there's also that global connection, bringing in that sugar trade, connecting to those larger ideas. All of this we're getting from one recipe. Look, Brenda, over here, you're over here. Uh, you know, half the ingredients were imported, right? So they're not just coming from this. So Washington is part of the global world. Um, uh, what else? Warren says they liked big food. They might've liked big food. I mean, that cake was probably a very good size. Um, and then I kind of want to get to the second half of Mandy's comment, um, where she said that the, uh, you know, enslaved people would have been making this recipe. Um, and does this seem like an easy recipe? Yes, they would have had it memorized maybe, um, but it's a hard recipe to make. Um, and so even to have that recipe memorized, you know, this is a skill. This is a skill. Um, these are incredibly talented people. These are incredibly talented chefs um, living in enslavement at, enslavement at Mount Vernon. Um, and so that's something that we can learn about the, the enslaved population just from this one recipe to know how to make the cake batter and then the icing for it, to know that the reliance of the Washington's hosting abilities is put on these talented people. Um, so that's incredible. Um, other things somebody pointed out, I'm going to try and scroll up to find it, um, but somebody mentioned there was no standardized way of spelling um, back then. So yeah, how many of you pointed out or saw that this recipe, um, things are spelled funny, not the way that we use it today. What about the measurements? Those are a little different than ours. Um, so yeah, this is incredible. I'm looking at other comments. Sorry that I just find 
Uh, Jeff Wood made a comment on YouTube that says it was typically made for 12th night, which was their anniversary. Um, boop, boop, boop. Uh, that's incredible, Jeff Wood. That's a really great thing to point out. We get to connect this primary source with other sources that tell us when this cake was made. And Twelfth Night is exactly when this cake. It's for very special occasions. It's for wedding anniversaries. Twelfth Night is that last night of the Christmas season. It's when people are traveling and coming together. And it's a very big celebration. And so that's the importance of this cake. Um, oh, OK. I'm loving this. Um, what other? Questions, did anyone have for that last idea? What questions do we still have? What questions does this recipe make us want to, you know, investigate further? Would the cake be a dessert? Um, yes, it would. Okay, it would be, yeah, served for after the meals, um, served to the guests while there's entertainment. And if it's 12th night, there's probably dancing and music uh, from the Washington family and their guests. What were the holidays like at Mount Vernon during Washington's time? Special, special decorations, parties? Um, yeah, well, as some of you, could, as we've seen some of these could be very large affairs, um, but they are, they're having family and friends and it's that 12th night. So those are the 12 days between Christmas uh, and the Epiphany, so January 6th. Um, and so that's when family is traveling. It's coming together. It's not necessarily as crazy and big as we do it today. There weren't as many, you know, obviously there are no light Christmas lights <laughs> on Mount Vernon, um, but they're decorating with greenery. They're making special foods for the family. Um, the enslaved people were given a couple days off um, around the holiday season. Um, and then uh, which didn't happen throughout the year. And then they're back to work while the the Washingtons are hosting. Um, so it is for the Washingtons a very special time um, bringing people together. And a lot of weddings did happen at that point because families together. Um, and so anniversaries would be celebrated as well. Um, okay, so whew, I think we did it, right? I think that we did it. We just analyzed our primary source. Um, and so even though, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so even though we didn't necessarily use this very source, we didn't, you know, this one, it's a little gritty, it's hard to read. We read the exact transcript. And so that is something that, when looking at primary sources, you can do too. If it's hard to read the cursive, if it's hard to see, if it's in a little bit of tattered form, always go for that transcript too. It's gonna pull out the exact same information and really help us still make connections with those sources. So it's great to see what it looked like in their time, actually see the handwriting of Martha's granddaughter. Um, but then we didn't lose any type of connection to it. We didn't lose any type of analysis of the primary source um, by using uh, by using the transcript. So that's a great connection. I definitely want to put that out there for teachers, for students um, to make that learning connection. Um, again, we kind of mentioned last week, what is the point of taking this time to do a historical analysis, to show you these great things, to get you thinking about Mount Vernon and the resources we have, if you can't make connections with them at home, if you can't make connections with them in the classroom, um, what's the point? So I'm gonna show you how you can access these things. Um, okay. And we're gonna share our screen. God, we are getting so good at this, you guys. We're getting so good at sharing our screen. So, whoops, spoiler alert down there. So, as we mentioned, always and forever, everything that we do on these Teaching Tuesdays, you may not be able to see me, but I'm using my jazz hands. Um, everything we do on these Teaching Tuesdays is gonna start and end on this online learning page. This is again the page where we connected our great resources, 
all the way through. Um, our very first Teaching Tuesday, we went kind of line by line talking about this page. So feel free to check out that archive if you'd like. Um, but this is where everything lives. Um, what we use today, the recipe for the great cake, um, that can be found if we scroll down to our digital primary sources. It's right in our Washington Library Special Collections. Um, you can find it um, just by clicking here, okay? And that is where we found this. See, you can see it's in the digital collections. Um, we even have a short link. Um, I can't see the page, but I'm hoping that the short link is up there to get you to these recipes, to get you to these sources, okay? So it's right here. And this is just a little taste, okay? Did you see what I did there? Um, it's just a little taste of some of those digital sources that we have. Um, now, while we're here highlighting the page, there are just a couple other things I wanna highlight for you guys, and those are possible extension activities that can be connected um, with this recipe analysis or connected um, with uh, um, learning about recipes. Um, and that is to highlight, I'm gonna highlight two more resources um, that are on our page. The first one is if we scroll down here to our, I'll scroll all the way over just so you can it, but it's our online student opportunities. We have a great inquiry based um, module for students to do on their own, or again, excited learners of all ages, um, but it's ice cream at Mount Vernon. And again, it's inquiry based. It takes students through a main essential question and then they build through, I'll show you the site. So you start with an essential question, a compelling question, and then you do research through three different uh, supporting questions. Um, and it's gonna pull out the same ideas that we had today, how you guys saw that the people that are eating this recipe, the great cake, were not the ones who were making it. And so this essential question is really, why was ice cream an exclusive treat at Mount Vernon long ago? Um, so it's a, it's a great connection for the younger learners to keep asking that and see those different ideas through different recipes. Um, the second thing I wanted to show you is another great whoops, connection through our library special connection for older learners um, is connecting to another digital collection that we have another primary source and that is the overseers account books um, and so this is just a great example and in these account books if you can see it again it's kind of hard but it lists provisions. It lists provisions for enslaved individuals at all the different farms. Um, so having your students dive deeper into this source to again, make that connection. The food that's being cooked in the kitchen at Mount Vernon may is not gonna be the same that's provided to the workers who are um, you know, providing that, that income and those skills and those trades that are making Mount Vernon that semi-self-sufficient plantation. Um, so this is kind of a great compare and contrast. What are some people on the estate eating through this great cake? Um, and then what are other individuals being provided? So um, again, we have a short link that I can't see, but hopefully came up. Um, on the site as well. So these are just great extension activities to make larger connections to the primary source because again, that primary source, oh good, look, that was the short link. Um, those primary sources, they're not full pictures for us, right? They just tell a little bit, a little part of the story. And so we can use other research, other primary sources to see where it fits um, in those larger ideas to teach us more about Mount Vernon, to teach us more about the 18th century, to teach us more about who lived and worked um, during this time. Um, I think that's all for me and Teaching Tuesdays. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. Um, I hope you were excited and threw up as many jazz hands uh, as I did. Uh, I know I'm a, I'm a talker, but just being able to get back uh, 
with you guys um, and talk about our primary sources and talk about the things that we can highlight is just so exciting. Um, again, thank you for commenting um, in our pages. I'm gonna make one last thank you um, to our generous donation. Um, that is the Hamill family of Arizona who are providing that family membership for those that have commented um, and, and participated uh, in this Teaching Tuesday, right? You always got to get those hands. Um, we're going to be back here, same time, same place next week. You may have noticed I wore my same teaching sweater. It's still going to be here. It's going to make its appearance. Um, tomorrow, Dr. Bradburn is back uh, to discuss the formation of the United States. Um, so that's going to be our Washington Wednesday. Um, so I, I Washington's involvement, I, I feel like there's gonna be a lot to say. So that's gonna be a great program. Um, the last thing I wanna do is just hype up a little bit of what next Tuesday's gonna be. Um, are you guys ready to know about it? Um, I don't know if you're ready for it though. Like, I, I don't know if you can handle what we're gonna do. Um, Cause it's kind of gonna be a big deal. Um, we, uh, if you're ready, we're, uh, we're gonna play the world's largest game of B Washington. Okay. So I'm gonna need everyone to come back. I'm gonna need everyone to tell their students. I'm gonna need everyone to tell their teacher friends. I'm gonna need everyone to tell their history lover friends to tune in Tuesday. Ryan, are you sure you're ready? I don't know if you're ready. I don't know if you can handle this, but we are gonna play the world's largest game of B Washington. All right, we're gonna play along and then we're gonna we're gonna facilitate it, right? We're gonna talk about it because it's Teaching Tuesday and we gotta talk about how the legacy of Washington still continues today. So, ah, uh, Whitney, that's exactly how I feel. Uh, so excited. Um, and we just can't wait. So build it up, pass it around. We're all gonna step into Washington's boots. We're all gonna step into his role uh, and we are gonna find out how to confront those hard decisions that he did. Uh, and then we're gonna learn about why it was so important what he actually followed through. Um, Kelly, I can't wait, woo -hoo! So um, it's finally time for me to go. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this as a real goodbye. Um, thank you all so much for playing. Thank you for coming back. Um, thank you for tuning in for the first time. Um, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Okay. Bye. I think that's it. <laughs>